In these photos, we'll just do a quick tour. The main photo on top is a 4,000 square foot commercial cannabis greenhouse in Leadville, Colorado. The elevation there is 10,200 feet. You couldn't grow anything outside there in the summer as there's a potential for frost every month of the year. Um, but inside our greenhouse, we were able to create a highly productive environment for cannabis growing. Um, you can also see in the bottom left, we have a, an aquaponics greenhouse growing leafy greens predominantly in Arkansas. Uh, in the middle on the bottom is another aquaponics greenhouse in Denver, Colorado. That one existed and we helped retrofit it. And they are also a commercial greens operation. In the bottom right is um, the first cannabis operation that we have in our high yield greenhouse kit, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, also in Colorado. Um, with full light deprivation system, which you can see in the open position. Um, we began by designing smaller residential greenhouses where we learned a lot, tweaked designs. We shifted then into more schools and we're able to design greenhouses in places that normally wouldn't be able to grow food. We've got greenhouses in Vail, Colorado, uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, Connecticut, all places with pretty strong winter climates. Um, but because the students are in school in the winter, growing needs to happen in the winter. And we do that in a series greenhouse. Um, and then that moved into some of these ag greenhouses and all of that translated over to our cannabis greenhouse sector. Um, I often tell people that series is as much of a research organization as we are selling greenhouses or building greenhouses. Um, when we build a greenhouse, we like to track the data in that greenhouse, if that's okay with the clients, um, which allows us to make adjustments on our structures and on our control systems. Then we can build the next one after some minor tweaking, hopefully improve upon the prior greenhouse, and so on and so on. So it's never static here. We're always redesigning, trying to take it to the next level less heating, less cooling, whatever it is we can do to make the greenhouses more efficient. Um, we do a fair amount of education. We do webinars like these. We speak at different trade shows around the country. Um, we also do custom design for a lot of our clients. Um, and we do building as well, which can be full builds from the start. Um, we can do just the just the construction of the greenhouse itself. So once the foundation is already poured, um, we can send a single job foreman to a site to help with uh, to help organize and manage a local crew, a local building crew, um, or we can just do phone support for builders. Um, often, our clients have builders or building themselves, but they can call and check in whenever they need to make sure they're doing the construction properly, whatever step of the build they're in. Uh, we have four steps in our design process beginning with planning, obviously. We do a lot of hourly consulting for our clients. Um, oftentimes that could just be a few hours to make sure that they're making the right decisions in critical moments in the very early stages of their project. Um, we can offer energy analysis as well as shading analysis of greenhouses on specific properties. So we can see how it's gonna react with a building that's next door, uh, a tree that might be in the way, um, and we can also see how much it's going to cost in the cannabis specific situation uh, to cool the building in the summer in your individual location uh, or to heat it in the winter. Um, we also design HVAC systems and we can then do analysis on the whole system to see full operational costs before we ever put a single shovel in the ground. The next step is the design. Um, we do custom greenhouse design both residential and commercial. Um, those can be wood framed or steel frame. We can do architectural plans and drawings for either, um, which can get you to full construction sets that include structural engineering, um, everything you would need to submit for permits in your city or county if they are needed. The next step is the build step. We just discussed that. We can do greenhouses from the ground up. We can step in to construct just the greenhouse part of the project. 
Uh, we can strictly supply the materials or we can just supply the plans and you can build it entirely on your own with our support. And then lastly, support, we can support you during the build, um, but we also stick around after the build. And as I said, evaluate how the systems are working inside the greenhouse, offer suggestions for adjusting controls, maybe how you could change a venting strategy because the humidity is too high um, or anything like that. And we can watch on graphs and see how your greenhouse is performing and try and optimize its performance. So here we're looking at some sort of conservatory. This would be what we would call a traditional greenhouse design. Um, greenhouse design, when I speak with people, their mind instantly goes to something to this effect. Um, all glass, no insulation at all, no thought about what it's going to cost to heat it or cool it. Um, yes, it's nice to look at, but this design is really an English or a Dutch design and those places are not very sunny uh, and quite mild so not very hot in the summers and not very cold in the winters in colorado where we're based we have very extreme sunshine we're a thousand feet above sea level we have 300 plus days of sun a year um, so we have more than enough sun we also have very hot summers 90s hundreds and very cold winters. It can get down to negative 10, even negative 20 sometimes. Um, and a greenhouse design like we're looking at would, doesn't work well for what we're doing in Colorado. So what we're doing with Ceres is trying to change the idea so it's efficient for Northern Hemisphere growers. Today, a standard greenhouse looks not the same in style, but the same in materials. So again, we just have a steel frame and potentially single pane glass or maybe a six millimeter or maybe an eight millimeter double wall polycarbonate. There's zero insulation in this building. It's fully glazed. When I use the term glazing, I mean material that allows sunlight through. So glass or polycarbonate. Um, in the summers, Sorry about that. In the summers, um, this greenhouse requires a lot of venting and probably a lot of cooling as well. In the winters, this greenhouse requires a lot of heating because it has zero insulation and cannot really hold heat in. So all the heating that it does create escapes and needs to be reproduced. So you're burning more gas or using more electricity or whatever it is that you're using for your heating. Uh, the second largest cost of commercial greenhouses in the country is utilities. So again, heating, cooling, lighting are really expensive and they make a huge difference for your bottom line if you are the grower. Contrary to that design, here is one of our energy efficient greenhouses. Again, this is the Leadville greenhouse up at 10,200 feet in Leadville. As you can see, it looks quite different than the last greenhouse. We use fully insulated, tall north wall. This greenhouse has a small lean-to off the back, but the greenhouse comes from the peak and drops down to the ground. Um, fully insulated, R28 north wall. East and west walls, fully insulated, also R28. And even a low knee wall across the south, R28, four inches of foam with steel on the inside and the outside. The polycarbonate that we use is a 16 millimeter polycarbonate. We'll get into that in a little bit, but it has a significantly better heat retention value than what traditional and standard greenhouses are using today, but still allows 80% light transmittance. So here we have a standard greenhouse on the left and an energy efficient or passive style greenhouse on the right. Uh, the standard greenhouse allows sunlight to come in and then it allows sunlight to leave. Um, it also allows heat to come in and heat to leave. The energy efficient greenhouse on the right allows sunlight to come in, but our white reflective north wall then catches that light and bounces it around. So we see higher light levels in 
the energy efficient greenhouse design than we do in a standard greenhouse. Orientation is a conversation we have with many of our customers. Um, many traditional greenhouses, a lot of hoop houses are oriented north to south, like the greenhouse on the left here. And we orient our greenhouses east to west in much more of a passive design style. As you can see here, our north wall on the east to west greenhouse, or the right, the greenhouse on the right, with the north wall being insulated, we have a pretty big insulated north wall. If you look at the greenhouse on the left, the north wall is pretty small and insignificant, so even if you were to insulate it, it wouldn't do much because it's a small amount of the wall surface area of the total greenhouse. This allows us on the right, in the energy efficient greenhouse, to take in more sun and to hold more heat and to bounce around more sun. The greenhouse on the left, people would say it has more uniform lighting because it takes sunrise and sunset, um, but it can't reflect sunlight like the greenhouse on the right can. And in the end, we get very similar growth out of the plants, but the greenhouse on the right requires many less inputs to get there. Back, this is more of that orientation conversation. In the summer, the sun is high and the greenhouse is getting light, and we'll say both greenhouses are getting light, either a north to south and an east east to west. In the winter, when the sun is low, you can see that our greenhouse is prime, is, is perfectly located and situated to take that sunlight throughout most of the day. And because the sun is low and the north roof and the north wall are insulated, it can hold that heat significantly better than a greenhouse that's oriented north to south. Glazing. A standard greenhouse, as I said earlier, typically uses single pane glass or maybe an eight millimeter polycarbonate. It has an R value of 1.5 to 1.6. Uh, a series greenhouse, as we just discussed, uses solid insulated walls on the north, the east, and the west, partially or fully on the east and west, with R values depending on where you're located, anywhere from 14 to 28. The difference between an R1.4 wall and an R28 wall is staggering. Um, it's not linear, it's, it's a bigger difference than that. Uh, and the ability to hold heat changes the game for the energy efficient greenhouses. The glazing in the roof, the non-insulated part of the greenhouse that allows the sun in, in an energy efficient greenhouse, is a 16 millimeter polycarbonate. So at, at a minimum, twice as thick as what a standard greenhouse is using. Uh, it allows 80% light transmittance, which in Colorado is more than enough, and in almost all places it is. Um, but it has an R value of 2.5, which doesn't seem like a huge difference, 1.5 to 2.5, but in reality, it is quite a stark difference. Here you can see the R values um, and the profiles of the different polycarbonates. And also in this graph on the right, you can see what, a slight, what that slight difference in R value actually means. So an R2.4 is significantly more insulating than an R1.5. At series, we use this polycarbonate on the bottom of the left graphic. Um, it is really resistant to weather. It has a thickened top edge. It can handle hail. If a tree fell on it, it would be okay, other than scratching. Um, and it can hold heat, not well, but better than any other glazing material that we've used thus far. As I just discussed on that Leadville greenhouse, the walls of an of energy-efficient greenhouse are obviously starkly different than the single-pane glass of a standard greenhouse. You can see here, this is the, the interlocking section of the insulated metal panels that we use. Um, what this does is allows for a consistent, unbroken insulation barrier around the entire outside of the frame. So we have no gaps in the framing. There's nowhere where metal 
framing is exposed and can bring in cold from the outside. It is a full blanket around all of the insulated parts of the energy efficient greenhouse. Framing. Um, in the image on the left, we have a hoop house, which uses a round aluminum frame, which is really common for hoop houses and is sometimes used in standard greenhouses. Um, on the right, is a series high yield greenhouse kit designed specifically for cannabis. Um, this greenhouse uses two by four galvanized steel framing. So the steel frame is a stronger steel, stronger than aluminum. And it allows us to get wind loads of up to 130 miles an hour and snow loads of up to 90 pounds per square foot. Thus far, we can go, we can go bigger than that if needed. Um, because of the strength of the steel framing. The other nice thing about the square or rectangular tubing is that everywhere that our polycarbonate sits or that our insulated metal panels sit, they're sitting on a flat surface, um, which gives better connection and more places for us to install our connection hardware. Whereas round tubing doesn't have as good of a surface, obviously, for placing materials, especially the polycarbonate. There's less surface area where the two actually meet. So the pros and cons of a standard greenhouse versus an energy efficient greenhouse. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that a standard greenhouse is going to be cheaper upfront. Maybe an energy efficient greenhouse might cost as much as double or maybe even triple the cost of a standard greenhouse, depending on what standard greenhouse we're talking about. Once the greenhouses are built, that's when you really start to see some serious changes. A standard greenhouse is going to have higher operational costs because you are heating them significantly more you're trying to cool them, you're working harder on trying to cool them. The materials are, will probably break down over time, which will require repairs or replacements. So there's a material cost plus a labor cost there. And, and also a lot of their systems are going to be oversized because they need more heat than their space would actually dictate, but because they're so leaky, they need more heat, and so you have to buy larger systems um, to maintain the environment that you want inside the greenhouse. Lastly, some of these traditional or standard greenhouses won't meet modern efficiency codes for some cities and towns. If it's considered an agricultural outbuilding of some sort, that's not going to be an issue. But if it's in town in a commercial zone or something, as many cannabis Greenhouse, greenhouses are, um, we have to deal with industrial and commercial building codes, and oftentimes we have to meet those building codes, which a standard greenhouse will not meet. On the energy efficient greenhouse side, again, we're more expensive to purchase up front, but the operational expenses are significantly lower. Um, in some places, in, in the Leadville greenhouse, we are barely heating, and it is the coldest place in Colorado. So if you're in more of a normal climate, you might almost never be heating and you may have totally eliminated heating costs and for the most part, lighting costs. Um, the materials used all have 10 or 20 year warranties uh, in the series greenhouses at least. Um, the polycarbonate has a 10 year warranty, but we've seen it last for over 20, the, frame has a 20-year warranty. The insulated metal panels have a 20-year warranty. So once this thing is built, there's very little maintenance that's going to need to happen to it. It's a really stout structure, uh, and which allows you to focus your efforts on growing plants instead of maintaining buildings. Um, and as I said, the series greenhouses can hit pretty big wind and snow loads for permitting purposes and conform to most efficiency codes in building departments, which will allow you to get a permit for the building uh, if those things are required. This is, oops, sorry. This is an older graph, um, but still quite relevant. 
Um, this was a 5,000 square foot greenhouse that we designed in Fort Collins, Colorado. As you can see, this one has a minimum temp of 55 degrees Fahrenheit when we did these energy calculations. Almost all of my cannabis growers are looking for something in the 72 to 75 degree range as minimum temp, even if it was 68 degrees. Um, the payback time would become much shorter when we're trying to keep greenhouses that much warmer at night in the winter. So in this graph, you can see that potentially the standard greenhouse was going to cost $150,000, $160,000. A series greenhouse was going to cost, let's say, $210,000. So maybe it's a $60,000 difference. Three years later, we've now broken even on our investment. And again, if we were trying to keep this greenhouse at 70 or 75, it might be two and a half years. It might even be two years. Um, and after 10 years of operation in this situation, with a serious greenhouse, you spent $480,000 or $90,000 total. And with a standard greenhouse, uh, you spent over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's a three hundred ish thousand dollar savings on the series greenhouse over time and it's really important to understand that um, we realize that upfront costs are one of the biggest hurdles that a lot of our clients are dealing with but if if this is a long term scenario um, this is an important graph to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that many of our cannabis clients are paying off their initial investment after less than one year of um, full production in the greenhouse. So once you've filled the greenhouse in less than a year, most of our clients have paid back the entire investment for the greenhouse, um, which is really important to think about as well, because then your lower operating costs mean more profit down the road. Heating and cooling systems. So one of the other things that we do is climate control inside the greenhouse. It's an important part, obviously, of any greenhouse, and especially cannabis. Um, as I said earlier, in a standard greenhouse, you have to upsize some of the systems because of the inherent leakiness of the greenhouses. Um, so larger heaters, larger fans, um, and all that means it's more expensive to purchase in the beginning. So yes, the building's cheap, but the systems are slightly more expensive potentially. Um, when you design a properly built building, um, an energy efficient greenhouse is every, every seam is sealed. There's no gaps. We have very few unanticipated um, air exchanges. We're controlling everything. Uh, we can install significantly smaller furnaces because the heat that we generate stays in the building and anything that we lose we've calculated that we're going to lose through the ceiling so we know what's going to happen um, and basically it just allows us to scale down on all the systems we still design for um, we still design for maximum heating and cooling loads like the peak days but in the end, we can use smaller systems and save you money. This has been one of the most interesting conversations that we've been having over the past year. Uh, for most of our cannabis growers, almost all of them, one of the first questions I ask anyone is, do you have land and can we vent? Or are you more in town and is smell going to be an issue? Um, for people who are on 60 acres and building greenhouses, the ventilated greenhouse option on the left is obviously the cheapest to install and operate. Um, we just have large intake louvers and large exhaust fans. And assuming it's not too hot outside, um, we can just vent all day in the summers. And well, let's just be clear, the summer in an energy efficient greenhouse is hands down the hardest growing season that there is. The other seasons are significantly easier. Um, summer is the hardest. Um, a sealed greenhouse is what we're doing for people who are more in town, um, in commercial zones, industrial zones, 
And oftentimes people are having to submit scent mitigation plans stamped by engineers. Um, these greenhouses have minimum required exhaust. So there are humans working in the building. There is a minimum required amount of air that needs to be exchanged, uh, fresh air in and stale air out. In the Leadville example, I believe it's an 800 CFM fan. Um, that we can filter because it's minimal airflow. But when you start getting into huge exhaust fans, it's virtually impossible to remove the smell from those. Um, and so we work on different systems to, to control the climate in the greenhouse. Um, again, cooling is the hardest part of greenhouse growing. And when you seal the greenhouse, cooling becomes even harder, but doable. The first thing that we usually look at is our ground air heat transfer system, also known as the GAT. Um, in this image, the GAT system is heating, um, but during a sunny day, the GAT system would be cooling. Um, so in this, in this image, if this is your first time seeing the climate battery or GAT system, uh, this is probably at night. It's getting cool in the greenhouse. A thermostat turns on the fan in the back left corner of the greenhouse, which would be the blue arrow pointing down. The greenhouse sucks, or the GAT system sucks cool air down into the soil. The soil has been warmed all day because we've been blowing hot air into the soil. And the air that comes out of the exhaust pipe is warmer uh, and heats the greenhouse. Now, in the middle of a sunny day, the greenhouse with the airflow going in the same direction would be pulling in hot air, warm, hot air, down through the soil. The soil would take a lot of the heat. A phase change would occur where the humidity in the air would condense into liquid water because it's cooler underground. It would dehumidify the, the air and cooler, drier air would come back into the greenhouse. This is an enclosed system. It's inside to inside. So if you were adding car, uh, CO2 for your plants, this would not affect levels. You wouldn't diminish levels by doing this. Um, and it helps um, when the sun pops instantly and the greenhouse starts to warm quickly. The GAT system can handle those things. It works really well in the spring and the fall. Currently it's April 19th and the GAT system is ideally situated to maintain temps in greenhouses at this time of the year and in most places in the country. Um, but this system does have its limits. It cannot keep a greenhouse in the middle of the winter at 72 degrees. It can keep a greenhouse at 55 degrees, but for most of our growers, that is too cold. And at that point we would turn off the GAT system and then turn on the, the furnace or the propane burners. Um, Payback period is usually three years in a GAT system. Um, they end up costing around $8 a square foot is a good general rule. And yeah, in a, you know, it all depends on utility costs, gas, uh, heating costs, cooling costs. But usually three years you've paid back the upfront materials purchased. To operate the system is minimal. It's a few fans. Um, and they're highly efficient. The next step that we would take in a sealed greenhouse, depending on size and scale, is what is called a, a cooling tower. Now, many of you have heard of a wet wall or a pad um, that's like a big wet radiator, usually on the west wall of a greenhouse. Um, and you suck air through it, add humidity to the air, which cools the air, that flows through the greenhouse and then exhausts through large exhaust fans on the other side. Most cannabis growers do not want to be adding humidity to their greenhouses. And so we avoid using a wet wall almost always. We virtually never use a wet wall because most growers want to keep humidity levels somewhere between 30 and 50 or 55%. Uh, and a wet wall oftentimes takes humidity levels way above and invites pottery mildews and bug growth and 
all kinds of things that growers really want to avoid. So we move towards cooling towers. Now, this thing works in a similar fashion as a wet wall, except it all happens outside of the greenhouse. So we use water and we evaporate water to create coolness, which we then run a fluid through, a glycol, or if it doesn't freeze where you live, could just be water, uh, and we cool that, that liquid. Um, and then we can take that liquid into the greenhouse and put it through fan coils or whatever else, and we usually drop the cooling onto the plants because the coolness falls towards the ground. So just above plant height, we have these fan coils, and we can drop cooling on the plants. The hottest air in the greenhouse is way up high, and so we try and keep those two things separate. Uh, and this works out to be highly efficient because most of the cooling comes from evaporating water, which doesn't require energy. Um, there are systems we designed that have this system along with a chiller. Um, they're in sequence. And so if the cooling tower can't make the water cold enough or we need more capacity, then a chiller would turn on to, to cool more water. We are currently working on a project in Oregon for a cannabis grower where we're using evaporative cooling towers uh, or, or the concept of evaporative cooling towers. But what we're doing in, before the cooling tower, he has a ditch, an irrigation ditch and water rights. And the water runs at about 50 degrees all through the summer, April through October. So our goal is to just use that 50 degree water to send straight through the cooling, the cooling towers. Uh, the, the fan coils, I apologize, in the greenhouse and avoid the cooling tower as much as we possibly can. If the water ever stops flowing or if we need added cooling, we can turn on the cooling tower. But in that situation, the cooling tower is a backup system and we're trying to work off the ditch alone to save even more energy. Dehumidification is a huge part of this. Um, in the winter, we get high humidity levels in the greenhouses and in a sealed greenhouse as well because we don't have airflow and we don't have fresh air coming in to just absorb the, the moisture and take it out of the building. Um, the GAT system that I just discussed is an initial step in reducing humidity levels. It works the best when the air is warm. Warm air holds more water vapor, which means when we push warm air with a lot of water vapor underground, it releases more water when it condenses, um, aiding the GAT system in dehumidification. When it's cold air, we have less dehumidification happening, so we step to one of these next three levels. Next is just a standard standalone commercial dehumidifier. Many of our clients use these. Um, we normally place them on the north wall somewhere just above head height. Um, we scale accordingly based on size of the greenhouse. Um, these systems work totally fine. They work on humidistats. The issue is that they produce heat and that heat is then in the greenhouse. So on summer days, you're dehumidifying and heating your already hot greenhouse. In the winter, that heat can be beneficial. In the summer, definitely not. And again, cooling is more difficult than heating, so we'd rather have that heat outside of the building. The next bullet is an Agam-style desiccant dehumidifier. Um, Agam is an Israeli company, and this is a desiccant wheel dehumidifier, and these are basically standalone units that you'd bring into the building into your greenhouse, they use a silica gel to absorb water, and then they use gas usually, um, a gas furnace, to then dry the water out of the silica so that it can go back and absorb more water. They are pretty efficient and effective. Um, but again, this system is inside the greenhouse, so the heat it's releasing is inside the greenhouse. So on a summer day, again, you are dehumidifying, but you're heating. In the winter, that heat, again, is beneficial. The last bullet is a custom-designed desiccant dehumidification system, which is what we do. Um, and what we do here is basically design a full HVAC system 
for the greenhouse or if it's multiple greenhouses for the greenhouse complex. And we build our own desiccant dehumidifiers, but we build them outside of the greenhouse itself. So our best example here is the Pacific Northwest. So let's say we have a grower in Oregon on the West Coast, on the coast, and it's wet almost all winter. But you still need to bring in outside air from time to time, but that's very wet air. With any of these other systems, that air comes in wet, and then we try and dehumidify it in the greenhouse. With the custom system, we actually dehumidify the air outside of the greenhouse in our mechanical systems zone and then send it into the greenhouse. So the humid, the humid air from outside, because it's raining or whatever, never affects the greenhouse itself. It's, it's treated before it ever gets into the greenhouses. These systems can also uh, maintain humidity levels of the interior greenhouse air. So we forget about the outside air for a second. They're also circulating interior air, just greenhouse air, and keeping humidity levels where we want them to be. Um, and the third benefit is that that dehumidification is happening outside of the greenhouse, so that heat is not in the greenhouse. Now, if we want to use that heat, we could duct it into the greenhouses. There's ways to do that. But the best part is in the summer when it's hot, we're not in the greenhouse creating more heat with our dehumidification. A lot of the equipment that's being used um, these days is more efficient than it used to be, obviously, and that all can help with the overall efficiency of a commercial cannabis greenhouse. Now, we are not at all experts on the most up and coming light that there is on the market, um, but there are LED lighting um, that are more efficient than older thousand watt high pressure sodium bulbs. Um, the greenhouse itself and any greenhouse itself is going to be more efficient because you're using those lights maybe 30% of the time that you would have been otherwise because we're using sunlight. And then if you use an LED because we're mostly using the sunlight for our growing light uh, and we're using our hung lights to offset that, to extend photo periods, and to augment light on cloudy days. Um, we've really built a lot of efficiency into that lighting system. The light deprivation system can help with efficiency because it adds an extra maybe R1 to the, to the insulating value of the roof. So on really cold nights, you can close the light depth system to increase insulation and hold heat. And you can set your controllers, I'll get to in a second, to do that. Um, fans, obviously, there's a wide array of fans, but there are some that are more efficient than others. There are some that use power better than others. We can wire a greenhouse to have three phase, and then all of our fans become more efficient as opposed to using 110 volt fans. And these are all things we think about in the early design process before we ever get to building the greenhouse. Uh, a series greenhouse, especially an enclosed energy efficient greenhouse, is much more efficient with CO2 because we're not exhausting all that CO2 out back into the atmosphere. We're holding it in the greenhouse for pretty long periods of time, which means you go through much less CO2 while still being able to maintain levels. Lastly, the greenhouse controls are a big part of the efficiency of our greenhouses. We can stage the systems that we have in the greenhouse so that they only turn on when they're needed. A really nice example is um, the lighting sensor that our greenhouse can have. Um, it has a PAR light reader, and we put it right near the canopy of the plants, so it's reading kind of what the plants are reading. And the grower gets to set whatever a minimum light level is for his plants. He wants it to be X light in the greenhouse at all times. Um, but it's sunny in the morning, the light depth system opens, no lights need to turn on, and then a front moves through and it gets gray. Sometimes there's a lot of light coming through clouds. The power reader could, power reader could read that and decide now we're okay, we don't need lights. If it got a little too dark, the power, power reader would just go back to the controller, say level low, and the controller turns on the lights. And if the sun pops in an hour, the lights will turn off again in an hour and we only use the lights for an hour instead of 
had we manually been controlling them, we might have just turned them on and left them on for the day. And we find big cost savings in those things. The same goes with our GAT system. Our GAT system could be heating or cooling on a if the sun's just coming out um, or if the sun just went away. But at some point, we might need more heat than the GAT will allow. And our controller can say, OK, we're going to turn off the GAT system and turn on the furnaces. And the furnace is more expensive to operate because it's burning gas. So we're going to try and minimize how much we use it. But we obviously use it when it's needed. So this is the last slide that we have for you, which is performance, which in the end is really what we're talking about, how to make this greenhouse work with the least amount of inputs. Um, so this is back to our Leadville greenhouse. This is April 2016. Again, these are the this is the data that we collect in all of our greenhouses. And so we can look at these and track what's happening and how the greenhouse is working. The blue line is outside temp. Um, with an average, which is the straight line, that average would be about 38 degrees, we can say. And the green line is, you know, daily readings and also an average, which we can say is about 78 degrees, maybe 76 degrees. Oh, not 78. Um, and this is with no backup heating at all, what we're looking at. So the temperatures in Leadville, you can see on the 12th of April, got down to maybe 24 degrees and the coldest it got in that greenhouse was maybe 69 degrees um, that was a 45 degree delta um, change in temperature without any backup heating so you can see how a 24 degree day would normally require maybe significant amount of heating in a standard greenhouse and in an energy efficient greenhouse um, there's no heating required at all because it can hold heat so I believe that that is the end of our presentation. Um, thank you for watching and feel free to reach out to us. If you have any questions, um, you could email us at info at series, C-E-R-E-S, G-S, as in greenhouse solutions.com. Thanks a lot.